Hi, I'm the MedPod engineer, John Termel, and this is an update of the federal court action for damages and for a declaration that marijuana law is repealed going on in federal court right now. And uh, the Crown has filed a motion to dismiss all of the applications, 310 of them, um, without a hearing. And this is an explanation of the Crown's motion record for knocking out your claims for damages and other things. Okay, so for the fun of it, count how many times I list and enumerate when the Crown misleads or outright lies. It'll blow your mind. So here we go, the Crown motion to dismiss all Gold Star claims. This is the federal court between in the matter of numerous filings seeking a declaration pursuant to Section 52.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and a few other remedies we asked for, not mentioned there. And I don't even know who the actual plaintiff is in the matter of, you know, can't find the file at the federal court where these documents in the matter of go to. So, motion record. In it, the index, they have one notice of motion. Two, letter from Canada to the court asking for the right to do it. Three, letter from Bradley Hunt to the court. And then they dropped that, left it blank. Guess they wanted to leave him out. Four, written submissions of Canada. Five, my affidavit for summary judgment, sworn April 8th. Six, the letter from Canada to the court. And seven, written representations of the defendant, April 22nd. So, the first stuff was asking the judge for the right to be able to make a motion to dismiss. And giving himself 20 days to file it, and us 30 days to file a response, and um, then 10 more days for them to reply, then it goes to the judge. And they're trying to waste time and bring it up to August until after the new regs are here. So, notice a motion. Canada's motion in writing to strike the proceedings. Take notice that the defendant respondent will make a motion to the court in writing pursuant to Rule 369 of the federal court's rules. Now, I wrote a letter asking for a direction that this not be heard in writing because the 310 plaintiffs all had a live hearing when the Crown got their stay pending the Allard case. And here we have the same 310 with the biggest one of all to dismiss their case and end it all, and the Crown wants to do it in writing without a live hearing. And he expects 310 people to all produce motion records in response. And then, of course, the lesser wordsmiths will be at a disadvantage, right? So I'm asking for a live hearing like the last time so the people can have their say. And we'll see what the judge says. So, uh, now... The Crown motion is for an order striking the proceedings listed at Schedule 1 to this notice of motion without leave to amend. Two, any alternative, an order staying the proceedings listed at Schedule 1 of this notice of motion and adjourning the within motion pending the making of new regulations to replace the marijuana for medical purposes regulation. And I ask why? If we win A2 and get repealed, the law repealed, we don't need the new regs, do we? And the new regs have nothing to do with damages from being shut down by the unconstitutional MMPR. Three, in the further alternative, in order consolidating the proceedings listed at Schedule 1 to this notice of motion. So if they lose, they want us all consolidated into one case, fine, except for when we get to the personal damages at the end, then they got to all be split up. Um... So I don't see how consolidating is going to help like it did for the 26 people at the Court of Appeal. Down here, there are too many varied personal remedies claimed to be dealt with all as one. And providing, Crown, and providing that the time for further steps shall run from the date of the court order. And I said, new steps until the new regs come in. And they get their remedy too, waiting for the new regs anyway. Uh, four. In any event, an order removing the minor plaintiff, that's got to do with Hunt, who filed a motion for his kid. Five costs in the motion of the proceedings. Now, the Crown wants everybody to pay for asking for the remedy they just won with Allard. 
If Conroy got costs for winning A1, why shouldn't we too? <laughs> Isn't that funny? They brought it up and it looks like we have a neat new card. Six. Such further and other relief as this court may allow. So did the unconstitutional MMPR really repeal the MMAR? The grounds for the motion are, since February 2014, more than 300 self-represented plaintiffs have commenced virtually identical claims in the federal court. 310. Except for differing damages suffered. Yes. Same ground. The identical claims are based on kits downloaded from the website of the plaintiff, John Termel, and are here and after referred to as Termel Kit Claims. The Termel Kit Claims are being collectively case managed with two other proceedings which seek similar relief, namely Bradley Hunt and Derek Francisco, and I'm going to drop their paragraphs from this because they've got nothing to do with us. And the proceedings seek declarations that the Marijuana for Medical Access Regulation, MMAR, and or the MMPR are unconstitutional. So yeah, we asked for both. We had 20 flaws against the MMPR and 16 flaws against the MMAR. Five, the Hunt claim and Francisco application also seek were not incorrect. And so, six, since the proceedings were commenced, the MMAR have been repealed and the MMPR have been declared of no force or effect in Allard. Uh, so, <clears throat> the question is, if the MMPR was declared of no force and effect, could it repeal the MMAR? Seven. Since the proceedings were commenced, the Supreme Court of Canada has also issued a decision in R versus Smith, which recognized the right of medically authorized persons to possess cannabis derivative. Actually, it did more than that. It struck down not letting them use it as a violation of their rights. That is the constitutional decision we like to use. Eight, the requested declarations are accordingly now moot. Now, actually, if the unconstitutional MMPR did not strike down the MMAR, list A's complaints against the MMAR, 16 beefs, have not been adjudicated. Notice that because the MMPR has been mooted, the Crown sneaks in the half lie with the half truth. Now, I'm putting little splotches in my text just to mention how many times the Crown misleads the court. With a good reason to hear it. So, uh, listen, basically, we're backing up our bad faith arguments against Health Canada with bad faith and half truth by their lawyers. <laughs> so, the Crown, the other requested remedies are unavailable as a matter of judicial committee, stare decisis, or jurisdiction. Now, you don't shouldn't know what that means, but here it is. They say you can't claim damages because of these code words. Comity, Webster, mutual courtesy, civility, comity of nations, courtesy between nations, as in respect shown by one country for the laws and institutions of another. Two, stare decisis means already adjudicated, so you can't. And three, and the Crown keeps saying that all our stuff's already been adjudicated in Allard. Three, jurisdiction. And they say we got no jurisdiction for a remedy. But that's it in response to the claims for damages. So, committee of judges is courtesy between judges, as in respect shown by one judge for the decisions of another. But how does adjudicating your damages claims be not courteous to any other judges somehow? Two, had any other judges ruled on damages before? Three, how did the court have jurisdiction to remedy Allard, but not to remedy the Gold Stars? <laughs> Remember, Kurt even, at, Kurt even asked for Bino, which was thrown out. So why can't we now? So that's it. Their whole case against having your suit for damages be dismissed. Nothing but nothing. Crown nine. The Termel Kid claims also seek orders striking marijuana from the Schedule II to the CDSA, or alternately permanent exemptions for the plaintiff's personal medical use of marijuana, PMU, they got it in, 
or in the further alternative, well, because he's reading our stuff, damages for the loss of plaintiff's marijuana plants and production sites, right? So the Crown likes lumping other relief all together. I don't, just because they do. Uh, paragraph 10, Francisco, 11, Hunt, 12. The federal court in Allard declined to suspend the marijuana provisions of the CDSA. Well, actually, what does he mean by declined to suspend? There was no official motion to do that, right? So, and, or to exempt the Allard plaintiffs from those provisions. So, uh, CDSA and exemptions, you know, A2 and B remedies. Now, I said it wasn't dismissed on the merits because our remedy A2, B no, wasn't in the original Allard statement of claim. That's why Kirk couldn't make it. 13. The request in the Turmel Kit claims and Francisco application for similar remedy should be rejected as a matter of judicial com committee. Well, I have no idea what he's talking about, like which decisions are going to cause discourtesy to other judges. So how does judicial committee benefit from rejecting our claims? 14. It is a general rule of public law that absent bad faith or an abuse of power, damages are unavailable for unconstitutional legislation. Sure, but the Crown did abuse their power that the MMAR self grows had to be shut down over concern for fires their affiant testified posed a serious threat to society when there had been no fires in the Allard evidence. They abused their power when they presented false surveys and fraudulent conclusions to support their nine times too low 150 gram cap on possession. Lies and more lies are the grounds of the crown abuse of power. 15. So we're saying, yeah, they did bad faith and they abused their power. But he doesn't, he forgot we said that. 15. As the Turmel kick plaintiffs do not plead bad faith, or an abuse of power, their claims for damages should all be, should be rejected. But we do plead bad faith behind the legislation to shut them down that harmed them. We know we had to do that. 16. Canadian courts have consistently affirmed the constitutionality of requirements for physician approval to use marijuana. And I said, who cares if courts have affirmed the constitutionality of requiring recalcitrant physicians to gatekeep the medicine they won't hand out? And that's saying it. That's already solved anyway. The MMPR has been struck down. The requests in the Hunt claim, shh, gone. 18. This honorable court is also without jurisdiction to declare the DPRA. Oh, that's again Hunt. Okay. Uh, the pleadings fail to disclose a reasonable cause of action. That's cool. It is plain and obvious that the claims fail to disclose a reasonable cause of action. It is not plain and obvious that the claims fail to disclose a reasonable cause of action when they're based on so many conscious lies and exaggerations. Although they broadly allege that the MMAR, MMPR, and CDSA violate the plaintiff's rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the pleadings do not contain any facts concerning the plaintiff's personal circumstances or capable of supporting the constitutional violations alleged. The pleadings contain enough facts to show they were exempted and estimates of the damage suffered by losing their exemptions at the protect the viability of the regime, whim of the court. The pleadings are frivolous and vexatious. The claims are so lacking in material facts and are so prolix, argumentative, or unintelligible as to also be frivolous and vexatious. David Shea is dead. And while the Crown feels vexed while his frivolous application for medicine was stayed at the request of the Crown, that's frivolity and vexation rolled into one. The claim of the minor plaintiff in hunting in, all right, hunting in 22. So that's it. End of that. Following documentation will be used. John Bricker, the Crown Attorney Execution. Tab two is the March 30th letter. Tab three, the hunt stuff they pulled out. 
tab four Department of Justice letter again about the li about getting the uh, right to have the motion presented. Then my affidavit, and then the uh, okay to lift the aff lift the stay that has expired, but they don't want them to file my summary judgment, which was already filed. <laughs> anyway, written representation, part one, overview. It's going to have the Termel kid claims, the Hunt claim. We're not do that. L R and L. The federal court stays the present certain uh, proceedings. The Supreme Court of Canada decision in Smith. F trial decision in Allard, and G the present motion. Points and issue. Part four, submissions. The requests for declaratory relief should be dismissed as moot. The requests for declaratory relief are moot. The court shall decline to exercise its discretion to hear the moot issues. B, the relief sought are available as a matter of law. Judicial committee precludes the requested relief from the CBSA. Uh, damages are unavailable for constitutional legislation. It's settled law that physician approval requirements are constitutional. It's plain and obvious the claims do not disclose a reasonable cause of action. And the claims are frivolous, vexatious, and abusive process. And the claim for the minor has nothing to do with that. Overview. These proceedings seek declarations that the Marijuana Medical Access Regulations, MMAR, and the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations, MMPR, are unconstitutional. Get that? We're going after both. Since the proceedings were commenced, the MMAR have been repealed. And they were unrepealed as soon as the MMPR have been declared of no force and effect by this court in Allard. The repeal of the MMAR and striking down of the MMPR has rendered the requested declarations moot. So because they struck down the MMPR, that makes the MMAR still invalid. Challenging it still invalid and moot. So funny thing about them striking down the strike down order. <laughs> so there was no repeal of the MMAR if the unconstitutional MMPR could not repeal it. So our constitutional complaints about the MMAR should continue. Two, the proceedings also seek other forms of relief that are unavailable as a matter of law. The request to strike marijuana from the CDSA or for exemptions from that statute are barred as a matter of judicial committee. Similar relief having been recently considered and denied by this court in Allard. Oh, I should have put two more lies there. Okay, so because Kirk Tussauds' request to strike marijuana from Schedule 2 was denied in Allard on the failure to seek the remedy in the original statement of claim, as we have, not on the merits, our claims have now been settled and it would violate judicial committee to settle them again? And because their motion for exemptions without limitation was refused, our exemptions for personal medical use should too? Yet exemptions are not barred by judicial committee since exemptions have been granted when necessary in the past, even if the without limitation exemption was refused for Allard. Crap. The plaintiff's requests for damages are also barred by the general public rule against damages for harm suffered as a result of unconstitutional legislation. And that's another misleading thing. He forgot to mention absent bad faith. Damages are not barred for harm suffered as a result of lying to enact the unconstitutional legislation, the harmful legislation, fire danger when there had been none. Three. In any event, even were the requested relief available at law, the claims fail to disclose a reasonable cause of action. It's not reasonable to sue for damages due to enactment of legislation that harmed us under false pretenses. Won't all that lying and exaggeration come back to haunt Health Canada now? Crown the claims contain no details concerning each plaintiff's personal circumstances. Well, that's another lie. 50 of them have filed affidavits averring medical need. The others are staying and will be on the way their affidavits when the action continues. The uncontested affidavit evidence contains proof of medical need. A guy with a 30 gram per day prescription who grows it himself at a buck a gram and was shut down and forced onto the 10 bucks a gram MMPR. 
paid out an extra $270 a day because of unconstitutional legislation or suffered the lack. Count the days since the unconstitutional MMPR cut them off, multiply by 270 bucks, about two years worth, and have a neat number of only 200K worth of suffering or cost. To a lawyer, dealing with numbers hurts their little conditioned brains so much they can't cope. To them, nine bucks a gram for the days you were improperly cut off is just too big a poser to be able to solve. But they just cannot meaningfully respond. <laughs> but keep in mind, judges are former lawyers. <laughs> just as bad. All right, Crown. Nor any facts capable of supporting constitutional violations alleged. Well, yes, there was the fact in my expert affidavit that the odds of survival are decreased by prohibition of the world's most useful medical vegetables. That's the main fact in evidence. It's killing people. We don't need any facts capable of supporting the constitutional violations alleged anymore. Allard won that part for us and eliminated our need to win it too. Absent these material facts, the Crown says, another lie, not absent were 51 affidavits with our facts. Canada cannot meaningfully respond to the claims, and this court cannot properly consider the charter issues. The Allard Court could and did properly consider the charter issues. We don't really have to, except for the MMAR. I guess he forgot. Now we're talking about personal remedies. Crown. For all these reasons, the proceedings should be dismissed. Part two, statement of facts. A, the Turmel Kid claims. Four. Since February 2014, more than 300 self-represented plaintiffs have filed virtually identical claims at federal court registry offices in Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and they forgot three provinces. <laughs> Isn't that funny? We had 10 provinces, all of them in the mainland. The claims which are based on kits downloaded from the website, lawyers can't get anything right, are based on the kits downloaded from Termel and which are accordingly here and after Termel kid claim. See declarations at the MMAR, which were repealed on March 31st, maybe not, and the MMPR, which succeeded the MMAR, are both unconstitutional. Bingo. Allard, just the MMPR. In addition to this declaratory relief, the claims request orders striking marijuana from the Schedule 2 of the CDSA, Bino. In the alternative, they seek permanent exemptions from the CDSA for personal medical use. And in further alternative, damages for loss. That's not an alternative. That's all on its own, okay? Damages for the loss of the plaintiff's marijuana plants and production sites when the prior personal production regime embodied by the MMAR was replaced by a commercial licensed production regime embodied by the MMPR, which was unconstitutional. The Hunt Claim and Francisco application, B, and I'm skipping that, The Termel Kid claims are being collectively case managed with those other two. Seven, eight, and nine paragraphs of the C. Allard and others versus Her Majesty the Queen of Red Canada. Ten. At the time the present proceedings were filed, the federal court was already seized with a comprehensive constitutional challenge to Canada's medical regulatory regime. Allard in right of Canada. Like the plaintiffs in the application in the present proceedings, the plaintiffs in Allard sought declarations that the MMPR infringed Section 7 by unreasonably restricting access to marijuana for medical purposes, as well as permanent exemptions from the CDSA for the plaintiff's personal medical use of marijuana. Bam! Lie! Yes, like Allard, plaintiffs sought declarations. But, unlike Allard, Allards didn't seek them for personal medical use. I have to count every half true. Okay? They did that's a lie. What am I saying? Out and out, the Allards did not ask for personal medical use. They were refused but without limitation. Okay? So I guess that's the first instance of them ducking the without limitation. Let's see if they mention it later. There it is. Got him in a lie. Eleven. As a trial of their action could not be completed before the MMA were repealed. 
The Honorable Plaintiff is also brought a motion for an injunction on behalf of all, per all persons medically approved to possess marijuana. By order dated March 21, the federal court, Judge Manson, granted their motion in part. Now, I wonder if he mentions the other part. The Allard injunction order preserves authorizations to possess and licenses to produce that were issued under the MMAR and that remain valid on the date specified in the order. With the exception that the amount of marijuana that can now be possessed is limited to 150 grams, the limit specified in the MMPR. And Justice Manson, when he accepted the government's estimated averages from their surveys of two grams on average, had actually stated in the same paragraphs that the doctors in Canada had prescribed an actual average of 18. So, he knew the average, act was, average was 18, and he accepted the government's fraudulent surveys that it was two. That's why he came up with a five. Hey, five's plenty if the average is two. But it ain't plenty if the average is 18. And in the very same paragraph where the judge accepts the estimate, he had the actual average. <laughs> Guess he never took a stats course, and we got this kind of thinkers doing our judging in a high-tech world. I think judges ought to have a course in Boolean algebra. And if they're no good in math, they shouldn't be judges. Okay? Let them stay lawyers. Lawyers will say anything. Judges shouldn't be able to. As the trial of their action could not be completed before the MMAR were repealed, I already got that. The lie. By order, yes. The Allard injunction preserves the authorization of that trial. Now, grandfathering all produced permits back to October whether expired or not, but not grandfathering all possessed permits cut off half the 36,000 self-growers in order to ensure the viability of the MMPR by forcing them onto the higher priced products. And of course, managed to not mention the 18,000 who got cut off. Notice? Mention the 18,000 who still got in. The federal D, the federal court stays the present proceeding. On March 7th, the federal court cramped and CJ issued a direction temporarily staying the Trammell Key claims pending determination of the Allard injunction motion. In so doing, the Chief Justice observed that the Allard injunction and Trammell Kit claims raised the very same issues. And even if Crampton got it wrong, they're pushing his error. Another lie. Seeking MMAR repeal and seeking MMAR extension are judged the very same issue? <laughs> anyway, 13. Following the Allied injunction order, the defendant in the Termel Kit and Hunt claims, Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Canada and the respondent to Francis Coppertine, the Attorney General, brought a motion for the further stay of the proceedings pending final disposition of Allard. By an order dated May 7th, the case management judge, Mr. Justice Daly, granted Canada's stay motion in so doing, he noted the substantial overlap between the Allard litigation and Turnell Creek claims, and that the claims sought relief that was very close, if not identical, to one another. Except the stuff that didn't overlap, right? Duh. They wanted to save the MMAR, we wanted to repeal it. So why was there jurisdiction for them and not for us? But note the overlap means there was some not overlap. It makes our point that there are some not overlap issues that remain to be considered. 14. In staying the proceedings, Phelan J. also expressed concern with the sufficiency of the pleadings. I mean, he wanted to play doctor and wanted to see our x-rays, but he just said, you ain't got enough. Or I'll give you more time to send stuff in. I won't tell you what you need. Filed with the plaintiffs. Filed by the plaintiffs and the applicants. He noted that there was a dearth of detail, paucity was the actual word, in some of the pleadings, and that many suffer from a paucity of information. Those using the term kittens blindly may wish to consider whether doing so will advance their particular interest. Better just be left out and die, is what he's saying, or rather than try with this long shot. Vague generality and hyperbole are not always of assistance. Well, if you can't get the main generality and you can't get the hyperbole, I guess not. Lawyers may not know when enough is enough and so need to replicate the proof of fact ten times. Engineering elegance allows me to only do it once with the best. 
engineers call just enough elegance. Lawyers call just enough paucity as if it's not enough. The difference between high tech and low tech is sure, you got the Trump ace, but I'd like to see more before I'm convinced. Duh. My elegance is unappreciated. What can I say? But who'd expect lawyers to appreciate KISS? Keep it super simple, elegance. The judge would have preferred lots of duplication, like lawyers always proffer. Then again, calling engineering precision vague generality means he doesn't get how natural law works. Thinking you need more than one proof shows you didn't catch the first one, right? <laughs> anyway, posterity will judge which of us was right. Is an MMAR permit insufficient evidence of medical need? <laughs> posterity will judge. Phelan and Jay provided the plaintiffs and the applicant with 10 days to amend their pleadings to address these concerns. However, neither the plaintiffs nor the applicant availed themselves of this opportunity. Phelan ordered the Crown to delineate the applicants into MMAR protected and not within seven days. Once those who are listed protected found out, they had 10 days to file more that they didn't need. But once those who were not listed as protected found out, they had three days because Judge Phelan said their days, 10, started right away while the protected got it all 10 days after their list came out. Gee, you know, uh, oh, and worst of all, the Crown only informed those who made list A and never informed those who needed to file in three days at all. Gee, wonder why so few filed. <laughs> Imagine, almost like being tag teamed by the judge of the Crown. Nevertheless, 50 had already filed their medical affidavits, even if no more did. So because no more did, doesn't mean none did. Another lie. Get a splotch in there. And there are 26 who appealed his refusal to accept that the uncontested affidavit as valid. Imagine sworn testimony with no crown response, and Phelan said it wasn't enough to believe. E, Supreme Court of Canada in De Smith. The plaintiffs and the applicant in the present proceedings allege that the CDSA and or MMPR are unconstitutional in that, among other things, they permit possession and production of marijuana only in dried form while prohibiting other marijuana derivatives. Yes, plaintiffs allege CDSA and MPR are invalidated by dried only. Smith and Allard only alleged the MMPR invalid, not the CDSA. CDSA is brand new. Even though Kirk brought it up at the Supreme Court, they threw it out there too because he hadn't filed it originally. Twice Kirk tried Beano, and now they're trying to say that because he lost those Beanos, I can't do Beano. Not quite mooted by Allard, right? Seems there's still some unfinished business. 17. Crap. On June 11th, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a decision expressly addressing this issue. In R. versus Smith, the court found that the restriction to dried marijuana was contrary to Section 7 of the Charter and declared Section 4 possession and Section 5 trafficking of the CDSA to be of no force and effect to the extent that you prohibit individuals with medical authorization from possessing cannabis derivatives for medical purposes. F. Trial decision in Allard. The federal court, Phelan J., issued its trial decision in Allard on February 24th. The court found that the MMPR infringed the plaintiff's rights under Section 7 of the Charter and that the infringement was not justified under Section 1. The court therefore declared the MMPR to be of no force or effect, but suspended its declaration for six months to provide the government time to develop a new regulatory regime and, of course, let a lot more people die. Isn't that disgusting? From the first day of Parker, when the judges said, we find that denying prohibiting marijuana to epileptics violates their right to life, we're going to suspend our decision for a year and let an extra year's worth die. Every time they suspend a violation of the right to life decision, they're letting more people die. 
four epileptics a day times 15 years, 1,500, that's over 20,000 dead epileptics extra because of the courts. Need it? And I can count them all. So, uh, the federal court issued its decision. The court declared MNPR of no force in effect, but suspended. In declaring the MNPR invalid, Dale and Jane noted that we also considered suspending the CDSA provisions, which make it an offense to possess, produce, and distribute. Lie. No, he didn't. He had unofficially denied the strike motion request with little time for consideration since he could not grant it for want of notice before then not granting it. <laughs> anyway, luckily, we're not seeking to suspend the CDSA provisions. We want no force and effect. Suspends like it stays over our head. They want to make something with a mere comment on Kirk's failed request to strike the word. Sure, the judge refused on a technicality, but he made the comment that they now want to call a ruling. I'll tell you what it is later. I only point out there were no facts filed or in consideration for Bino. Just a quick, can't do that. However, he declined to do so. Well, he couldn't do so. Noting that the reading down of the CDSA was a blunt instrument, which may not be necessary if the charter compliant regime were put in place or different legislation passed. So the blunt instrument of striking the word off the list to make all prohibitions come down may not be necessary if they finally come up with a working exemption. No need of the blunt instrument, maybe. Now, the comment was that people needed protection against the offense when there was a bad exemption. But actually, protecting them was too blunt. Forgetting how Bino works. Blunt instrument may not be necessary is all he said. Not that it was not appropriate. Sorry, I'm still asking because it is my right to have the blunt instrument against evil. Too blunt is another lawyer concept, like too precise. So bluntness is what's needed and the judge didn't have what it took to deliver the blunt solution that may be too blunt. Okay, it sounds like he chickened out on bluntness, but of course he couldn't rule anyway, could he? All right, although the Allard claim had also sought permanent exemptions for the CDSA, from the CDSA for the plaintiff's personal medical use, and he lied again. They were seeking it for without limitation. Not mere lying, actual lying. Allard did not seek exemption for personal medical use. It was rejected for being without limitation. Gee, I love catching them in outright lies. Then, hey, it helps our case for bad faith, right? Then again, the judge ignores it and often repeats the lie. <laughs> I accept the crown position. That was false. All right. Fam and Jay also declined to grant that remedy, opting instead to extend the Allard injunction until such time as the court otherwise orders. Well, it makes sense that if Manson declined exemption for Allard's personal medical use, Phelan should decline ours too. Except Her Majesty lied about the first Manson decision being identical on personal medical use. The clear message his paragraph meant to convey. In order to prove bad faith on the part of the government, I wonder if we can list all the crown lies from all our previous motions. They've been so crooked with lie after lie. Surely if their lawyers are that crooked, we can argue the legislators advising them are too. After all, the crooked legislation all comes from the crooked lawyers at the Ministry of Justice with more crooked lawyers defending their crooked lawyers' works in the court. 20. Of the plaintiffs and the applicant in the present proceedings, 162 meet the criteria of the Allard injunction and are entitled to its benefit. So about 148 have claims for damages, even if the 162 do not. Though they can still bitch about having to live under the internet condition, right? That's still a lie, never dealt with. The present motion. The time to appeal the Allard trial decision has now passed without an appeal. The stay of the present proceedings having therefore expired, Canada wrote to the courts on March 30th to advise of its intention to bring a motion to strike. By order dated on April 6th, Phelan directed Canada to bring its motion by April 26th. 
But note that Canada did not have to move to lift the automatically expired stay like Phelan forced me to do. Quite the double standard. And though he helped them, they then threw him under the bus by pointing it out in their letter how he'd made me lift the stay they thought was automatically expired. 22. On April 8th, the plaintiff, John Turmel, served and attempted to file a motion for summary judgment. In his motion record, Mr. Turmel acknowledges that his requests for declarations in relation to the MMAR and MPR have been rendered moot following Allard and also purports to abandon his claim for damages. Lie, half lie. Two. Anyway, I claim the unconstitutional MMPR could not have repealed the MMAR and rendered moot our actions against the MMAR and I would not drop my brother Ray's challenge to its onerous conditions, would I? I'm only purporting to drop the damages claim for 300 bucks. I'm only purporting. I might still not do as I purport. Calling me a liar? Them's fighting words. Well, they're getting the fighting words. All right. Points in issue. The issues are the requests for relief have been rendered moot. The other requests are unavailable for judicial comedy, start decision, and jurisdiction. And it's plain there's no cause of action, and the proceedings are frivolous and vexatious. That's their argument. Every technicality in the book. Not one chance to deal on merit. With a pack of lies, too. A. The request for declaratory relief should be dismissed as moot. The Supreme Court of Canada has established a two-step test for deciding whether to dismiss a case as moot. At the first step, the course must decide whether the case is moot in the sense that a decision will have no practical effect on the rights of the parties. If moot, the court must then consider at the second step whether there are any reasons to nevertheless hear the case on its merits. So, after Allard proved the unconstitutional violation, we sought a ruling on repeal or damages, which will have no practical effect. <laughs> Come on now, lying again. But a court can still hear a moot case. And notice how they try to duck a hearing on its merits. All the time. Crown, paragraph 24. The rationale for this rule is clear. It is the role of courts to resolve disputes. Adjudication in the absence of a live dispute may deprive the court of the necessary adversarial or factual context, while at the same time consuming scarce judicial resources that could be better spent assisting the parties live disputes. So they're saying because the Allard case killed our dispute over that exemption, we ought to kill our dispute over no offense and damages. There's no dispute here, so kill it to save cash is what they're saying. 26. In constitutional cases, the Supreme Court of Canada has also called on courts to remain sensitive to their role as to the adjudicative branch in our political framework and to avoid pronouncing on matters that will not affect the rights of parties, but that may be seen as intruding into the role of the legislative branch. So pronouncing on whether you were damaged won't affect your rights and will intrude into the role of parliament. Lying without even a semblance of coherence. Ah, one, the requests for declaratory relief are moot. How many times are you going to say it? Since these proceedings commenced, the MMAR have been repealed. Maybe not. And the MMPR have been declared by this court in Allied to be of no force and effect. Therefore, it couldn't repeal the MMAR. The legislative substratum for the request of declarations of invalidity has accordingly disappeared. That's right. We won. With respect to the leg... Oh, yeah. With respect to the legislative restrictions to dried marijuana, the Supreme Court in Smith has also declared Section 4 and 5 to be invalid to the extent that they, you know, deprive people from using drugs. The requested declarations in the present proceedings are accordingly moved. He's saying that because they said you can't prohibit them from having their stuff, that it basically only applies to them and not to our guys. It's mooted. Anyway, Lord. Just lying again. All right, 28. Oh, I'm going to have comments here. Uh, the MMAR have been repealed by the unconstitutional MMPR. Keep saying it. I'll keep adding the lies. I'll have replaced the number later with the count. And sure, Smith having one dried only unconstitutional, one of our grounds, is now mooted by the victory. Not loss. <laughs> 
<coughs> the federal court in Allard suspended its declaration for six months to provide Canada with time to develop a new regulatory regime. While the MMPR remained in effect during that time, yeah, the one that ain't working remains in effect. <laughs> the present proceedings cannot practically be decided before the MMPR expire. An adjudication would therefore have no practical effects on the rights of parties. Why can't repeal and damages not be considered while the MMPR is flawed, though not yet expired? Not, you know? So, they want to wait until there's a working model, not yet proven flawed, but they try hard, and then say, no more need for remedy. How that fits with past damages, I don't know, but shysters will say anything, right? Ground. It would serve no purpose to discuss damages for what we've done to them in these circumstances to continue to expend judicial and party resources on these proceedings. Canada, therefore, requests that the proceedings be struck. Any alternative request that the proceedings be stayed and that this motion adjourn pending the making of new regulations to replace the NMPR. So despite winning our grounds, now striking our remedy to save resources? Kind of makes you want to puke, eh? To hear our government speaking? Why should present proceedings on damages wait for the new regs? They're based on the fact the old regs didn't work. Get it? Anyway, just a moment. All we need is the declaration that the old regs were bad for the court to deal with damages inflicted on our patients while it was bad, right? You need any more? He thinks you do. Because of Allard, the present proceedings for damages would have no effect. Anyway, remember, crowds will very often state the very opposite of what the words mean, hoping you'll be fooled. Judges usually are. <laughs> anyway, two, the court should decline to exercise its discretion to hear these moot issues. Always ducking a hearing on the merits. Always looking for a back way out. And usually getting it. 29. While the court has discretion to decide moot issues, ah, there are no reasons to do so in this case. Relevant factors at this stage of the mootness analysis include the need for an adversarial relationship in court. Gee, we ain't been adversarial in our forum. The principle of judicial economy. We couldn't give a screw about how much money you're going to waste. Three, the proper role of the court vis-a-vis -vis Parliament. A, Parliament can't fix our damages. None of these factors warrants adjudication in this case. 29. And I'm saying lots of factors about why you shouldn't be able to claim damages once you've won your grounds. Anyway, on to more law. 30. With respect to the first factor, the need for an adversarial relationship, the plaintiff, John Turmel, on whom the other Termel kit plaintiffs have relied for their argument, acknowledges that the requested declarations are now moot and appears to no longer seek declaration that the MMAR and MMPR are invalid. Double lies again. Missed one line. Never said the MMAR declaration was moot. Did I? Did I? Nice, pure, out-and-out -out lie. But keep lying enough and the judge will probably forget or fail to see the truth. And I wonder how he appears to no longer seek it when it's still there. Anyway. Oh, okay. It only it only no longer appears to him because he managed to forget it. He wouldn't be lying to get it. Okay, absent argument from the plaintiffs, the court cannot properly adjudicate on these issues. Absent argument, the Crown doesn't want to allow the court to hear. <laughs> With respect to the second factor, judicial economy, these proceedings have potential to consume vast judicial resources. In its May 2014 decision, staying the first 222 proceedings, the court noticed it was faced with a somewhat unprecedented situation of hundreds of lay litigants, among whom it was difficult to identify a lead file. <laughs> it was difficult to identify a lead file. Probably still is. <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny. Um, or to realistically coordinate. Since that time, 88 additional proceedings have been filed. And in the course of these proceedings, 
The plaintiff has also brought more than 100 motions for interim relief pending trial, 42 appeals, and 17 applications for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, with significant likelihood of more such motions and appeals should the proceedings continue. No, more such appeals should the proceedings not continue. I did mention in my letter to the judge yesterday that, hey, if you want to, I'm not having people answer everybody this thing for the Crown trying to move this out. Only I'm answering. But I will allow everybody to file an appeal if you kick them out. <laughs> that they're all going to want to do. So, yeah, it's coming. And sure, David Shea is dead while his action was stayed, but remedy is too costly and late. So that's a lot of actions. So anyway, we gave him a lot of fight. 32. In weighing judicial economy, the court may also have regard to potential future proceedings. Would be better if adjudication on the merits would resolve issues and thereby reduce the need for future litigation, the court may exercise its discretion to hear the moot case. Well, that's about the best argument I heard for letting this thing go through, isn't it? That is not the case here. Well, I think it is. The MMPR have been declared of no force in effect. Not the MMAR. Oh, the MMPR, yeah. And it is currently unknown which, if any, of the MMPR features impugned in these proceedings will be retained in the new legislation, or whether a decision on the constitutionality of those features will assist parties in future cases. It's got nothing to do with the future regs. The claims for damages has got to do from the past regs. <laughs> right? Adjudication on the moot issues would therefore serve little practical purpose. <laughs> well, he just made the argument why it would. Of course, if the plaintiffs or the applicant in the present proceedings aren't satisfied with the new legislation, it's always open to them to commence new proceedings challenging the legislation at that time. Well, we're not challenging, we're not adjudicating on the moot issues. We're adjudicating on the issues he dubs moot. But if it resolves issues, the court should exercise its discretion to hear of moot. If anyway, crap. 33. With respect to the third factor, the proper role of a court, the Supreme Court of Canada has emphasized the need for courts to remain sensitive to their adjudicated role and avoid pronouncing on matters that will have no immediate effect on the legal rights of the parties. Now, he said that once or twice or three times before. But that may be seen as intruding in the role of the legislative branch. And what's getting damages for past errors got to do with the legislative branch? So getting the cash to shut down cost you would have no immediate effect on your rights. Allard already declared your rights were violated, didn't they? Saying nothing about any damages. So why can't you? In the present case, adjudication will have no immediate effect on the rights of the plaintiffs. An applicant has, but has significant potential to affect the legislative options available to the government in responding to Allard. Wow. I can have that kind of an effect if I get heard. They might not put in some of the options, the nasties, if I get heard. Me, eh? That is not this court's role. The proceedings should therefore be dismissed as moat. I put that on one line. Adjudicating damages will have effects on our rights. Who cares if it eliminates some bad government options? Good. Can't keep screwing it up. B. The relief sought is unavailable as a matter of law. Judicial committee precludes the requested relief from the CDSA. Oh, somebody's already decided that the Allard bed exemption doesn't mean no offense. He's going to argue, remember? It may not need a blunt instrument like that. May not. And he takes it to mean it does not, right? So, so being courteous to other judges means he can't follow the Parker decision. That said, you need to work an exemption to have a valid prohibition. 34. In addition to declarations that the MMAR and MPR are unconstitutional, the proceedings request that A, the CDCA prohibitions be struck down, B, ex yeah, yeah, that's what we asked for, yeah. The federal court considered, but declined to grant similar relief in Allard. Not the word similar, that's a half line, right? Similar, like, give us an exemption without limitation, is similar to give us an exemption for personal medical use. The only similarity is the word exemption, okay? And, uh, anyway. 
and a, the judge's mere comment that it may be too blunt, he can't convert into a court order. That now stare decisis applies to. Get it? So, B, that the court considered and declined similar relief in Allard isn't true. The only thing similar about exemption without limitation and exemption for personal amendment use is the word exemption. And the Crown, there's no reason for the court to depart from that conclusion in this case. True, Justice Phelan found that personal medical use was too without limitation, though it had always been the remedy of preference by earlier wiser courts. The doctrine of judicial committee requires that the proceedings be dismissed in these circumstances. And no, it doesn't, because those decisions weren't made. For those non-reasons and false precedents, be courteous to the courts whose words they twisted. <laughs> 35. The Federal Court of Appeal has characterized committee as an aspect of stare decisis. Like stare decisis, where you can't argue something again that's been decided officially, committee is intended to promote consistency and predictability in the law, as well as sound judicial administration. Committee provides that although not strictly binding, previous decisions by the same court are deserving of considerable respect and should be departed from only where there are strong reasons, also sometimes described as cogent reasons for doing so. So don't depart from his opinion that it Blunt, it may be too blunt. Okay? It didn't say it was too blunt, so don't have to depart. If he'd said it was too blunt, I'd ask you to depart. But he said it may be too blunt, so you can believe that until I've convinced you it ain't too blunt. So, except that the maybe too blunt comment wasn't a previous reasoned decision of the court on the merits, was it? No background information, no facts upon which the judge made his decision. How could he come up with a reasoned decision without any facts at all? He'd said earlier, but it's okay now that Phelan came up with a decision on something they like with an odd comment without any facts at all. Exaggerated into a real decision. So, strong reasons does not simply mean better arguments. Rather, the plaintiff requesting a departure from a previous decision must establish that either, and I put two lies here, there was no official decision previous on the CDSA challenge and no previous decision on damages. The word previous is a lie. Lucky this doesn't apply to us unless the judge fails to see the inanity in asking not to deviate from judgments not on our issues. <laughs> Don't deviate from that judgment over there that had nothing to do with us. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, crown. A, subsequent decisions have affected the validity of the previous judgment. Some binding case law or relevant statute may have come up. See, the previous decision was unconsidered. Hey, there's the proof. The judge, it was, and given in the circumstances where trial exigencies required an immediate decision without opportunity to fully consult authority. And that's exactly what Phelan did. He opened his mouth and gave an opinion about blunt, maybe not being, maybe being too blunt, and guess, exemption being too blunt, and guess what? The crowd's not trying to turn that into a decision, a previous decision. But the crowd has no previous decisions for comité to apply to. 36. While it declared the MMPR invalid, the federal court in Allard expressly declined to also suspend the CDSA straight down. Prohibitions on marijuana, a remedy the court described as a blunt instrument which may not be necessary if a charter compliant regime were put into place. So expressly said declined for lack of official notice. Then the judge added, don't bother asking, it's probably too blunt anyway. Sorry, I'm still asking, I like blunt. Exemptions without limit. So turn down exemptions with PMU. Phelan already decided personal medical use was too unlimited, like Allard. And yes, it preserves certain ATPs. I want to talk about the ones that didn't. So although the Allard plaintiffs also sought permanent exemptions from the CDSA, Phelan also declined to grant that remedy, opting instead to temporarily extend the Allard injunction which preserves certain authorizations to possess and licenses to produce marijuana previously issued by Health Canada under the MMAR. 
And of course, that is not true because Phelan did not decline. Well, he did decline, but he did not decline for the fact that they had asked for personal medical use too. Remember the original lie? He still hasn't mentioned without limitation is what the Allards asked for. Throughout all this, instead of just pointing out that without limitation is the same as PMU, what the judge said, he's now gone and lied and said it was PMU like us. So, so again, he misleads that our exemptions for PMU, like Allard's exemptions without limitation, are justified merely by hiding the difference. Notice to preserve certain authorizations. I'd rather say cut off 18,000 previous authorizations. Then again, I'm counting the victims and they're counting the self-growers they still have to knock out. Kind of covers up the left out dirty deed, doesn't it? 37. The plaintiffs and the applicant in the present proceedings now apply, attempt to relitigate those issues, but have identified no reason why the court should depart from its decision in Allard. Well, we are not attempting to relitigate the issue that was not allowed to be litigated in Allard. He keeps lying. This is brand new, Beamer. No suggestion the relevant legal issues were not fully considered, but how to consider something not on the claim and then apply refusal to us? No need to revisit the issue that wasn't visited? Doesn't constant misrepresentation by the government lawyers puke you out too? The Allard decision is just two months old and has not been overtaken by subsequent decisions. The Allard decision thoroughly canvasses the relevant case law and statutes and was based on an extensive evidentiary record and thorough legal submissions by all parties during a three-week trial. There can be no suggestion in these circumstances that the relevant authorities were not consulted or that the relevant legal issues were not fully considered. There was accordingly no reason to revisit those issues in the present proceedings. And we're not trying to revisit the bad exemption, are we? And if revisited, there is some risk that efficient judicial administration, as well as the values of consistency and predictability in the law, would be undermined. Well, I don't think so. As if trying to get damages once the declaration of unconstitutional regime has been won is not to revisit Allard. Allard didn't raise Bino nor damages. We're not relitigating Bino or damages, are we? Another barefaced lie. 38. With respect to the requested CDSA exemptions, this court has also previously denied similar relief in the context of these proceedings. Didn't mention without limitation. And in dismissing motions by several of the Tremelkin plaintiffs for interim CDSA exemptions pending trial of their actions, this court held that the requested exemption would be without limitation. And like the Allard one was without limitation, personal medical use is without limitation, said Phelan, you know, and was not tailored to the alleged charter violation, but appears essentially unlimited, says a judge who thinks personal medical use is essentially unlimited. Anyway, from the law, remember now, not talking about how much you can use, it's unlimited from exemption from the laws. The court noted, for example, that while the requested exemptions were for the plaintiff's personal medical use, it was unclear how a, me a medical need would be established. While specifically concerned with the motions for interim exemptions pending trial, those concerns apply equally to the requests for the underlying claims for permanent exemptions. This request for relief should be accordingly dismissed. Okay, I've already pointed out that despite exemptions for personal medical use being used three times by Parker judges, by Krieger's judge, and by Murnau's judge, Judge Phelan decided PMU was too without limitation for him before refusing the patients their medicine. Just couldn't be trusted not to break the law too much if they were exempted from the law a little. As for it being unclear how the applicant's medical need could be established, they'd all had previous exemptions signed by their doctors. Duh! 39. While not entitled to a permanent exemption from the CDSA, many of the plaintiffs and applicants in these proceedings are entitled to the benefit of the Allard injunction. While the remaining plaintiffs may continue to access the marijuana under the MMPR, 
may, if not can. Heartless monsters. Hey, they can always pay ten a gram instead of one. I'm going to put that down as a half-truth. Because if they cannot, they may not too, right? So these measures are sufficient to ensure continued access to marijuana for plaintiffs with demonstrated medical need while the new regs are made. So buying expensive is sufficient to ensure continued access. Jeez, lying again about how reducing their access is ensuring their access. But when a doctor's prescription doesn't convince the judge who wants to play doctor himself, you end up with David Shea. Phelan's diagnosis was that he could survive without an exemption. Oops, glad he never got a medical degree. Just another screw-up lawyer sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. I love pointing out how Shea died while his appeal for remedy was stalled by Phelan. Hope he's organizing a welcoming gauntlet Phelan can run when he finally gets his judgment day in heaven. You can bet when I get there, it's the first video I'm going to watch. Well, maybe after a few accordion concerts. <laughs> I got 50 years worth of fans up there for whom I was their last good time on earth. Damages are unavailable for unconstitutional legislation. Well, now they're going to argue that lying about fire damage for your grow ops to shut you down and lying about the average dosage to keep you short doesn't show bad faith. And honest incompetence by government has no remedy and needs none anyway once the patient has died. 40. The MPR required that any unused marijuana grown under the MMR be destroyed upon the expiry of those regulations. Several of the Tremelkit plaintiffs now seek damages for the loss of that marijuana and for their loss of their production sites. This request should also be dismissed. 40, I say. The unconstitutional regime enacted upon fraudulent dangers ordered them to destroy their legal storage. Why shouldn't they seek damages for the marijuana destroyed? 41. It is general rule of public law that absent conduct that is clearly wrong, in bad faith, or an abuse of power, the courts will not award damages for harm suffered as a result of the enactment of legislation that subsequently declared to be unconstitutional. Where bad faith or an abuse of power is alleged, the federal court rules also require that they be pleaded with particular clarity. Yes, can't claim damages for bad legislation, absent bad faith, with false evidence, perjured evidence, sworn to the Allard Court about danger from fire, about average doses, is not only clearly wrong, but in bad faith. Lying and ending up with corpses certainly doesn't show good faith, but also abuse of power. Where bad faith and abuse are alleged, it must be pleaded with particularity. Yes, we'll be pointing out the lies we're relying on to show bad faith. 42. Although they allege that the MMPR are unconstitutional, the Tremel Kid plaintiffs do not allege that they were enacted as a result of conduct that was clearly wrong. Well, oh, yes, we do. In bad faith, or that amounted to an abuse of power, the claim for damages is therefore destined to fail. Well, actually, we do allege the MMPR were enacted as a result of conduct that was clearly wrong, lying, in bad faith, or abuse of power. Otherwise, why would we ask for damages? We knew that it had to have bad faith. Five on, on C. It's plain and obvious that the plain claims do not disclose a reasonable cause of action. 47. Even were the requested relief available at law, it is plain and obvious that the claims do not disclose a reasonable cause of action. The claim should accordingly be struck in accordance with 221 of the federal court rules that probably say can't have unreasonable claims. Anyway, wonder if David Shea's action for his death, violating his right to life, is still going on. He has no cause of action. He's dead. 48. A claim discloses a reasonable cause of action if it contains facts capable of supporting each element of the cause of action. Well, I had an ATP. I had an operation. They ordered me to shut it down. It cost me this much. Gee, no facts. Da, da, da. 
Um, if fats capable of supporting each constituent element are not pleaded and are not pleaded with sufficient particularity, the proper course is to strike the claim. And our claim discloses a reasonable cause of action with facts capable of supporting each element. Fact, unconstitutional NMPR damaged patients by shutting them down their cheap supply. Canada can allege they see no facts all they want, but that's only because they can keep their eyes closed. Besides, Tucson asked for Vino too, just didn't file it right like I did. 49. The requirement to plead facts supporting each element of the cause of action is supplemented by the general requirement to plead all material facts on which the party relies. The reasons for these requirements are clear. Pleadings are intended to provide the other party with notice of the case to meet and to clearly define for the court the issues and dispute between the parties. Neither goal is achieved in the absence of material facts. Well, I thought the facts were clear that medically authorized people who were cut off were harmed by the unconstitutional legislation and their odds of survival were decreased, decreased by the prohibition. And they want to get cash. 50. The requirement to plead material facts is heightened in charter cases. This ain't a charter case. Okay, that, they did that. Well, okay, so it is a charter case. We're relying on the charter they won. Okay, the Supreme Court of Canada's caution that charter decisions must not be made in a factual vacuum. No, no, we gave them enough facts. The presentation of sufficient facts in charter litigation is not a mere technicality, but is essential to a proper consideration of the charter issue. Sorry, we're not pleading the charter anymore. Allard did that. We're only pleading the remedy. Remedy Allard didn't ask for right and damages they didn't ask for at all. 51. The present claims fall far short of these requirements. Although they contain a historical overview of Canada's medical marijuana regulatory regime, the Trammell, Kidd, and Hunt claims contain no details concerning each plaintiff's personal circumstances or interactions with that regime. Another lie! 50 of our applicants have filed their medical affidavit. Doesn't he remember the 26th at our appeal? Short-term memory loss. Needs a few brain cells. Should smoke some pot before he gets too much worse. Uh, the plaintiffs do not allege, for example, that the impugned provisions have restricted their personal access to marijuana for medical purposes. They can't have it anymore! You shut them down! Nor even that the plaintiffs have a medical condition with which marijuana would assist. Lie! They filed their affidavits stating their conditions. Allard and, and no, Allard proved what we alleged. We don't have to prove it. And getting left out is pretty good proof of having restricted their personal access, right? Manson cut you off. You didn't get access. And what about the 50 who filed their medical affidavits? Forget again? Or just hoping the repetition hypnotizes the court? By contrast, they say, the pleadings in Allard included considerable detail concerning each plaintiff's medical circumstances, more than they needed. All they needed was their ATP, the doctor said so, right? What did Phelan and the court need to see their x-rays for? Need to even know what they were exempted for? Did you need to know the guy had AIDS? Why would it matter? Uh, and experiences with medical marijuana and how they affected by the MMPR. Great, they did it for us. Lots of our guys were affected by Allard, either life or death. 52, the claims also fail entirely to address the material elements of the charter causes of the action alleged. Allard did that. We won't have to argue the similar claim. Was the whole purpose of the original crown stay in the first place, right? They said, hey, if Allard wins it, they won't have to argue it. So Allard won it. Why are you telling us we have to argue it right? Although they broadly allege violations of section seven, claims fail to explain how each of the impugned legislative provisions deprives the plaintiffs of life, liberty, or security person, or to identify a principle of fundamental justice engaged by that deprivation. Well, David Shea's dead when he might have been sick. I should explain that. He was engaging the right to life before the court sentenced him to death. That's section seven, right to life. In several instances, the alleged infringements appear to be entirely speculative and not based on any actual experiences under the impugned regulations. 
Yes, it was entirely speculative that David Shea and others might die. Too bad the court didn't heat those speculations. 55, similarly, with respect to the Hunt claim, gone. 54, this court has also previously expressed concern about the sufficiency of the pleadings filed in the proceedings. Phelan wanted to play doctor. In his May 7 reasons granting Canada's stay motion, Phelan noted the dearth of detail in the pleadings. Yeah, we told him, doctor said I had a medical need. He didn't think that was enough. And the Termelka claims, in particular, contained vague generality and hyperbole. We've heard this before, right? But a paucity of information concerning each plaintiff's personal circumstances. And should I explain again the difference between paucity and elegance? Is the difference between intellectually superior and intellectually inferior? So, absent these material facts, Canada cannot meaningfully respond to the claims, and it submits that these courts cannot properly consider the charter issues. The charter issues were already done, remember? The claims should accordingly be struck. What a low-tech intellect may consider paucity, a high-tech intellect considers engineering elegance. Doing the most with the least is an achievement lawyers never learn when padding the bill with replicated documents pays so well. Paucity does not mean insufficiency. It means not much. Sure, not much, but enough is enough to win. I don't need the king of trumps with the ace. Paucity of facts may not be much, but it is an absence of material facts. So pushing the misrepresentation of sufficiency again. This court has previously given the plaintiffs an opportunity to amend their pleadings to address the concerns raised in the court's May 7th reasons. The plaintiffs declined to do so in the full three days they weren't told about. Having declined once more before to amend their claims in the three days they weren't told about, Canada submits the plaintiffs should not be given a further opportunity to do so more than the original three days they were not told about. The claim should instead be struck without leave to a man. What a bunch of sleaze, eh? What about the 50 who filed their medical affidavits? I gotta say again, they didn't need to amend their pleadings. Lying with partial truth again. Because nobody amended their pleadings, must have been none. One, there were 50. And he knew the 26 at the Court of Appeal. And the ones who've appealed to the Supreme Court. But did they have a real chance to amend the pleadings with the judge's tricky timeline? And they're not informing all the plaintiffs? The judge ordered the Crown to produce list A, who were protected by Allard, and list B, who were not. And when that, when list A got their notification, they got 10 days to amend their filings. And when those on list B got their notification, they had three days. Their 10 days started now. So why would fail and give the protected who didn't need to file medical affidavits 10 days and the unprotected who did need to file only three days. No wonder no more than the original 50 got in on time. Worse, the Crown didn't send a copy of the document to list B, so they were never even informed that they had to file in three days. Sleazy, eh? You can't make this stuff up. It's the real Canadian government. Where in judge's order did it say that only list A should be informed? and not list B, okay? Did it say only those plaintiffs get it and don't bother telling those plaintiffs? I think that catches them in their sleeves. But haven't, now that's pretty, that's really dirty. So, but having been tricked into not responding, patients should not now be prevented from finally being allowed to file their affidavits. Of course, they might get another no notice three day deadline, right? The claims are frivolous, vexatious, and an abuse of process. Well, guess what? They didn't call the Allard claim that, right? We claimed it too. And they didn't call Kirk Tussaud trying for a Beano without proper foundation, frivolous and vexatious. They said it was just too blunt, right? And he wants to laugh at this. We won our declaration and he thinks it's frivolous. So not too frivolous or vexatious for David Shea to want remedy before he died of the lamp. 57. A pleading is considered frivolous and vexatious if it is so bereft of the fact. Yeah, we heard this before, okay? So, 
What may be incomprehensible to low-tech intellect may not be so incomprehensible to the high. Besides, he keeps forgetting the 50 medical affidavits he did not challenge. Why would he allege no facts of medical need when there were affidavits in evidence? And when the remainder filed their affidavits like the first 50 did, he keeps forgetting about those. First of all, the guys who didn't file, they were stayed, right? And they can still file now that stays gone. So he keeps forgetting about those who did file uncontested affidavits. Phelan just chose to say he couldn't be convinced they weren't liars. Finally, Bino wasn't so frivolous that Kirk Tussaud asked for the same. Crown wasn't laughing then. 58. The claims bear several of these hallmarks. As noted above, the pleadings are completely bereft of any facts concerning each plaintiff's. Yeah, if you forget the 50 affidavits filed personal circumstances. Such a Canada cannot meaningfully respond. How many times do they repeat this stuff, right? It's as if repetition hypnotizes. They must figure the judiciary are slow since it keeps working. <laughs> so, to be ref to respond, again, forgetting the fantastic 50 facts and evidence. 59. The Termel kit platings are also prolix. Now, that's probably the biggest lie. The most laughable. Webster's prolix extended to unnecessary or tedious length, long and wordy. <laughs> well, that's the first time everyone ever called Kiss Engineer prolix. <laughs> Any judges who know me know I talk fast and say it once, write it once too. Me, long and worth wordy? <laughs> Come on. Prolix. I never knew the word. I'm prolix. Anyway. At points, argumentative. Gee, something wrong with arguing in a legal case? And includes several statements inserted for color. Gee, something wrong with not being as boring and bland as you? For example, with respect to the requirement for physician approval to use marijuana, the claims note, legislation appointing someone ignorant of the treatment is tantamount to appointing a monkey as gatekeeper. And noting the fact that the monkey sometimes opened the gate, means the exemption is not practically unavailable. That's what they say. Remember, hey, some doctors open the gates. Yeah, but the others won't. So, you know, geez, if they don't know what the medicine is and they haven't studied it, it's like putting a monkey in charge is all I'm saying. And he thinks that's a little too hyperbole. Well, no, these doctors are worse than monkeys. Monkeys might do better than always know. Hmm. ACT. That's in the bad exemption part that is already won. And it has nothing to do with the motion for relief. But nice for the Crown to bring in something unrelated for backup. And excuse me, I think the doctors are worse than the monkey anyway. The doctors are expected to know why they'd say no and don't. No one would expect the, don the monkey to have studied up so his refusals were not on purpose. 60. Hunt Incompre incomprehensible and 61 the court may also dismiss a claim on the grounds it's an abuse of process a pleading is an abuse of process if it attempts to relitigate why issues that have already been decided in separate proceedings by a competent court of jurisdiction we're not relitigating what was never litigated yet nor decided in other separate proceedings on its merit as not i have to keep answering if he's going to keep lying as noted above, the plaintiffs and the applicant in the present case attempt to relitigate the remedial determinations made by this court just two months ago in Allard. Again, in a lie, we're not trying to relitigate Allard. We love it. We're delighted with the one remedial determination made so far and do not want to relitigate the Allard win. But of course, the Crown is pretending, maybe too blunt, dismissed the non existent motion to strike the word. Opinion of failure. At points in their claims, the Turnell Kid plaintiffs also dispute the correctness of the findings of the Ontario Court of Appeal in Myrna. That's a lie. The Ontario Court of Appeal in Myrna overturned the Taliano ruling that not enough doctors were participating, so be no bad exemption, no Section 4 and no Section 7 offense. The Court of Appeal ruled, we're not convinced that doctors didn't have good reason. 
So my constitutional challenge kits ask witnesses to state the non-medical reasons the doctor used to refuse. There's nothing in the Myrna Court of Appeal ruling about maybe doctors had good reason I can object to. So, another boner by Bricker. Crown, the plaintiffs identified no reason why this court should depart from those judicial determinations. Lie. And it would be an abuse of this court's process to allow the proceedings to continue in this circumstance. We're not asking the court to depart from condemnation of the NMPR. We love it. Those judicial determinations, that judicial determination, had nothing to do with ours. And that's a good report. Hunt claim improperly brought, sure, sure, sure. Order sought, we know what they want. An order strike of the proceedings without leave to amend. Any alternative, an order staying the proceedings, adjourning the motion, and finally consolidating. And in any event, they want to remove the Hunt claim and the uh, cost. So, the court seems to think that sufficiency can't be done with a paucity of evidence. It can't be done with just enough. You've got to have more. <laughs> it can be done with a minimal amount. And its sufficiency, its, its sufficiency and not paucity, should determine. And that's about it. So, that is the Crown's thing. Now, I'm going to put together a better motion record. Nobody else needs to do it. There's absolutely nothing to do with your personal issues that's going to be coming up here. You don't have to do anything. Like I said to the judge, if you're going to throw these people out without a live hearing, actually, if you're going to throw these people out and not give them justice, you're going to end up with 310 appeals rather than 310 wasted record motions on a useless motion. Get it? So, next, plugs up the right court. So that's where the 310 are going to get into action, not here. But if the judge wants to shut them down and say that you got no right to damages, this, you know, even when bad faith is established, simply because we don't want to give it to you, well, then we all will appeal, as many as possible. So that's basically where we are right now. And uh, so sit back and hope you're going to get your live hearing. Otherwise, you're going to get a nice gold star in the mail saying your case was thrown out and you're not going to find found out why. Okay? Oh, the judge might give reason, but he's not going to have anything related to you. Okay, that's about it. So, boy, makes you puke, except it's so funny, eh? But you should count up all the lies over the whole thing. It's quite amazing. I'm going to list them. You know, like this lie he said seven times, you know, and this one, this one, this one. This lie he said five times, you know, and this half-truth and this misrepresentation. But you notice he didn't mention the Allard without limitation once. He only discussed without sufficient limitation with respect to personal medical use. He didn't discuss without limitation, period like the Allards asked for. So he completely suppressed that. And that's why I enjoy pointing out what he really wanted to suppress the most as we leave this video. Thanks. See you next. Bye.